On this episode of Content Sessions, we talked to Paul Meller about Meller and Smith. Thanks so much for coming on. Cheers, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I, uh, I saw you on another podcast last week and your, the way your approach spoke to me in such a way, I was like, shit, I got to get a hold of this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it seems like you're doing, are you doing a lot of uh, podcasts and media right now? Is that kind of a part of your strategy? Um, yeah, I mean, I've been shooting my mouth off for a number of years, uh, but suddenly I've become sort of flavor of the month, I suppose. I mean, I've been talking about these the things that I talk about for a long, long time and working with clients about these things. But suddenly, you know, podcast people, interviews, I was interviewed on the BBC a couple of weeks ago and different things like that. And yeah, suddenly people want to hear what I've got to say. I think it's, it's sort of um, becoming much, much more pertinent as people realize how valuable it is to get noticed and take risks and be different to everybody else. Because I think people have really kind of understand now that there's so much vanilla out there in, in marketing and advertising that they suddenly, you know, even, you know, your mom and pop shop understands that they can't just be the same as everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. I love that sentiment. That's, that's, I mean, I think people are now starting to catch up to what digital marketing is, what, how social media works, have the power of it. I mean, they're still really behind, but it's nice that they're catching up so you can start having conversations about what can we do to make a splash. So I love the approach. So tell me a bit about the business of the agency. Yeah, so Mellor and Smith, I've, I set it up nearly 11 years ago now, um, and we are based in London. Um, we're based in Borough Market, which is a trendy part of London, um, and we work with businesses, large and small. So we work with you know, small little startups right through to some of the biggest businesses in the world, um, and we work with them on their advertising. So we're a brand and advertising agency. Uh, our um, our DNA is that we get brands noticed. That is it. We, we get you noticed. It is incredibly difficult to get noticed. 89% yeah. uh, of advertising is forgotten. Um, and we sit in that 11%. We, we make advertising that tries incredibly hard to get into that 11%. So just the, it's, I, I, I always want to just reference that stat because it's, it, it's, the, it's the lens with which through we look at everything so the average londoner and it's the same if you're in any kind of built up urban area the average londoner sees a thousand ads a day so that could be radio tv print mobile social media everything of those thousand 89 percent of them are immediately forgotten sure that's a, that's a fucking joke <laughs> and of those 11 percent seven percent are remembered uh negatively and only four percent remember positively so that's, yeah. I mean, that, that shows you how much of a shit the customer doesn't give about your product or your service. So you have to Nor should they, I feel, right? No, no, they shouldn't. You know, you've got to work fucking hard for their eyeballs and their attention. You know, yep. if, if, they gave, if they gave attention to everything, then, you know, it, it, life would be even more difficult than it is. Um, but yeah, it, like my job as an agency owner is to get my clients' uh, brands noticed. That's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, but it, it can be done and we do it on a pretty regular basis now. Awesome. So before we go into kind of the tactical side, because that's, that's an interesting kind of dimension of it. When you said you work with, you know, really small and then really big, that's usually, um, you, typically speaking, it's usually kind of we focus on small or we focus on big. Why do you, how do you work it where you've got room for both? So we work, so we work with the biggest company in the world. We work with Amazon um, and we've been working with them for the last eight, nine months. So they're huge. Yeah. Um, and we work with some other huge, uh, so in the U S we work with, um, Expedia, the travel company. I mean, they're right massive, on, yeah. massive, right. Um, and then we work with tiny little startups, um, uh, you know, that you would never have heard of. We work with some charities and we work with some mid and actually, we actually work with some mid market size firms. The reason why we spread across those areas is, um, Amazon aside, and maybe Expedia aside, you know, because they're, they're slightly different. The generally speaking, most industries split into very similar patterns. And so, if you look at the macroeconomics of an industry, so if we look at uh, like I don't know, accounting, let's say, you know, or professional services like management consultants, or you can look at I mean, look at any of them really. But the the biggest players in the biggest brands in that industry globally 
are interested in maintaining the status quo. And that would probably be the top three, four, five brands, right? Yeah. Um, we generally don't work with those, although I have just name dropped Amazon Expedia. But like, <laughs> you know, they're a bit of an anomaly, right? Um, generally speaking, we don't work with those guys because they're interested in maintaining the status quo. The status quo works for them right now. So they're not interested in rocking the boat and doing things differently. They're interested in, in optimizing the shit out of what they're already doing. And we are not that business, right? Um, what we're interested in is people that are mid-market firms that want to get up to that big, uh, you know, one of those big players within an industry. Mm-hmm. Um, or they may well have been the biggest in years gone by, but they've fallen down the pecking order. And they're now a mid-market firm, but they were once one of the big guys. Um, so they, both of those, have to do something different to the really big players within that industry. Yeah. So we work, you know, with, you know, sort of market share place, you know, sort of maybe five to 15, you know, those are the, the um, uh, those are the people that have to do something different to the big guys and they have nowhere near the same budgets and they don't have the recognition and the, and the incumbent status that those big market, uh, uh, those big sh- uh, market share owners have. And then we work with the tiny little guys, the startups, that are trying to get into that industry but nobody knows that they exist yeah i mean like other than their mum and dad you know <laughs> uh, like nobody knows that this little startup exists um so they have to do they really have to do the complete opposite to everybody else because they've got literally no fucking chance if yeah. they uh, if they do the same as everybody else but just a little bit different no matter how innovative their product or service is they have to do 180 degrees different to everybody yeah. else because nobody knows they exist. And the only way that someone's going to care even at 1% that they exist is by being the complete opposite to what is deemed sort of the status quo. Um, so that's really why we end up spreading across different markets and across different sizes within that market, because what we, what we sell getting noticed works for you know the different parts of the industry in different ways got it and in terms of in terms of your kind of service offering obviously it's really different for the startup with no budget versus the the guys who've got something to kind of launch up to but what are the main kind of products that you play in is it do you you guys do some experiential video creation all digital like how, how do you guys decide or how do you guys what are the biggest things you play with um it, it does depend on the client, right? So we are, uh, in, a, in a really wanky media term, we are media um, ag- uh, agnostic. I know that's Got probably it. a very, very British thing to say, yeah. right? Uh, but I'm a, I'm a uh, say it as it is kind of guy. Um, the, essentially, we don't choose the media. With the idea is what starts, and everything starts with the idea. And then the, you know, the, the media, the tactics will follow beyond that. But largely speaking... Um, we uh, sort of play in a number of areas in brand, brand development. So that isn't just a logo. I mean, it can be, but it's yeah. largely, you know, often not. It's much more than that. It's, you know, what do you stand for? What is your promise? Why are you different? What is your story? Um, and then all of that, how that l- sort of uh, reverberates out. Um, and then advertising. And that can be TV, out of home, so billboards, TV, radio, it can be social media, um, it can be experiential, um, it can be stunts, um, it can be really anything. Um, yeah. And, you know, you talk about the, you know, the, the little guys that have no money compared to the big guys. Yeah, you're right, you know. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're a disadvantage. Uh, they're a disadvantage budget from a budget point of view. But that is it. Yeah. You know, uh, you, you only have to look at, I mean, like, look at the, uh, the climate change um, uh, protests that have gone on and they've gone on across all across the world. But Extinction Rebellion sort of started in London and it's, you know, it's one of those big, the big names that are doing lots of climate change activism. They've got no money. Yeah. Yet they have managed to get their message front and center of every media news outlet across the world. And they've done that on no money. And that's because they've yeah. taken a different approach to it. Every other time that there's been some sort of climate change protest. And that's a really good example. 
I mean, I know that it's climate change and not a product or a service, but this is, the principles remain. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And so what is your guys, your guys process? I know I was reading on your website that, you know, you're a small team by design. And so do you kind of have it where someone comes in and like everybody's huddled around at the beginning and you guys all kind of work through it together or how, how does your kind of internal process go? Um, so we're a team of 10. So we're, we're small and we're small for a reason. I mean, we're 10 years, we could have grown much bigger, but I have no interest in growing a big agency. I want to, I want to grow the, uh, the best small agency. Um, the, which is the difference to, which is different to everybody else. I mean, I'm sort of, I'm purposely different in everything that I can do, <laughs> uh, much to my wife's annoyance. Um, but, uh, uh, how do we do it? Yeah. Everyone gets around the table. Everyone in the studio is involved in, um, in, in the creative at the start. So we don't work in those traditional teams. So in, in advertising, in years gone by, you would have what they call duos. So copywriters and art directors, two people working together as a, a duo. We f follow that principle to an extent, but we actually have a team of 10 uh, working on it. And then once everyone's kind of got their immediate thoughts out and can we get the ball rolling, then it's given to a, a duo and a, you know, as a team, and then they run with it. So we, we follow the print, you know, sort of old fashioned principle, but we do it. We, we like to get everyone out and, and involved first, and then we focus down on a team and, and those people will then run, uh, you know, run with it and run the project. And, and we found that over the years is the best method for us. Everyone's different, right? But that, sure. that works for us. Yeah. I know from our side, um, you know, we've, we've tried to adapt some of the, the more in-person things, even though we're a fully remote team. So it's been really, that dynamic's been really interesting for us where we're trying to, okay, how do you put the feeling of being in place in the same place into an actual remote team? And, you know, we use a bunch of tools, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a little bit jealous of, of having everybody in the space at times. Cause you know, lost in translation, you know, you get that kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah I, yeah, I like yeah. the office setup. And so what's, what's your favorite type of client? Like who, who's that, who do you have a sweet spot of like who you like in the door to, to work with you guys? The ones, the ones that want to get noticed, the ones that get it. Um, they, there is no sort of sweet spot. We have a, a few specialisms, I would say, industry specialisms within the business. Um, uh, you know, we, we have worked a lot in travel. Uh, we work quite a lot in um, the drinks, so alcohol sector. Uh, we work a lot in uh, technology. Those, I mean, those are specialisms, but we work in some really diverse um, uh, industries and we don't really have a sweet spot in terms of industry we have a sweet spot in terms of the appetite of the client so if they if they fancy it you know if they really want to grow and they really want they get what it is that they need to do then they are the absolute perfect partner and we will run through brick walls for that for that person um, you know uh, and the, you know the results that we've had sort of speak in that in that kind of general general vein um, we're not, uh, we're actually really easy to work with, you know, um, we get, uh, a lot of people ask me, so, you know, you, you must be quite difficult to work with because we don't like to, uh, we, we are, we partner with clients, but we, we say no quite a lot, you know, we're like, no, that's when, when they come up with ideas, that's not because we are the sole source of the best creative. It's just so mm. it, the law of averages mean that we're probably going to be the better place to come up with it. And they may try to, um, you know, kind of get involved. And that doesn't mean that we don't like people getting involved, but we're really clear about where the boundaries lie. Um, and, you know, we're, we're hired for a reason. Um, but that means that we're really easy to work with. You know, we, we like I said, we run through brick walls for clients. We'll, uh, we break the law. Um, you know, we'll, we will, uh, we, I mean, there's this, uh, we put on a stunt, they got quite a lot of press, uh, in the UK, we put on a stunt where we took over the, the underground, the London underground, one of the lines, the Bakerloo line. Uh, yeah, we took, we didn't ask for permission because if we did, we'd never been given it. And then the police right. would have been on our case. Uh, so we just put the stunt on, um, and took over the, took over the, uh, the, the underground line. And it was amazing. I had yeah. to like bribe a few of the uh, officials. That's right. like, yeah, like, well, like that's what we'll part do. Get it as part of the fun. That's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, 
uh, but that's you know that's that's kind of what, when I mean you know we run through brick walls for clients we really will but it's for the ones that get it and they, the ones that really want it um, and that's what we'll that's kind of what we do absolutely do you have a project or like a, a, a showcase piece that really stands out in your head of like you know that one that you're like oh man that was the best one we ever did uh, there's a few there are a few mm. um, there and there are some there are some good ones I mean the one that I just referenced there the the one on the uh, Bakerloo line that was a really good one it got some good press and which brand was that for so that was for Faulty Towers the theater experience quite a quite a niche uh, client we don't work with any other theater companies although quite happy to if there's anybody out there that's on Broadway <laughs> or in the West End um, but it, it, they are uh, you know they're a theater experience for the for the TV show Faulty Towers I don't know if you maybe you've heard that it's, it was really big no. in the UK and it has this cult following um, so we put that on and, and that got quite a bit of press um, we from it that I mean that's really B to C you know that is that's almost like that you know their, their market is tourists uh, coming into London um, from the other end of the spectrum, there's a, uh, we work with a B2B brand um, called Agencia, where they, they, they organize business travel for, um, for brands. So okay. you know, if, if yeah. you're a big brand, they will, they will book the, um, the travel for that. You know? So if you're IKEA, for example, um, they will book all the travel for IKEA's travelers overseas, you know, when they're staff are it's really big business, but it's, it's, you know, it's pretty dry. It's B2B and it's, it's not, it's, you know, it's not consumer orientated, but they, they were having, um, you know, they're grown incredibly fast. I mean, they're a really big business. Um, and they were getting attacked from both above and below in their market share. So they were one of those, you know, that uh, they had been one of those mid market firms that had grown and grown and grown and they'd got up to, so they were in, uh, fourth position in the market share globally um, and that's because they'd constantly done things differently but they were getting attacked from the guys above the first second and third and then there was the new startups that were nipping at their heels um, sure. yeah. so they're getting sort of attacked on both flanks and so we created a, um, an ad series for them that's run on uh, you know various media uh, that debased the competitor claims it's been so successful uh, so it took on and it characterized and caricatured the you know the the uh the big players and it caricatured the startups and said look you know we really are the the, the best of both worlds that was the that was the, the, right. the message really clever debased the, uh, the competitor claims uh, you know and it's gone from strength to strength the sales conversations they're having have, like been incredibly successful to the point where one of their competitors one of the big guys sent me a you know sent a very strongly worded uh letter <laughs> how cheesed off they were i'm like well, right fuck off I've done my job properly if, you, if right. you're getting annoyed like you're getting you should have hired I've me first fucker yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, and that's real b2b you know that's not that's not b2c at all you know that's sort yeah. of a, um, a really good example in that in that respect very cool and then um i i also heard that you kind of inadvertently got into the the meetup uh in person <laughs> kind of space so tell me tell me about that um, so we've been talking a long time to, you know, like I said, we've been going 10 years and we've worked with brands all over the world in that time. Um, and we've been talking about taking risks to get noticed. That's what we do. So we do the opposite, which is, which is you have to take a risk, do the opposite to everybody else, and that will get you noticed. Um, and I can only talk to one client at a time, you know, one boardroom at a time. I can sort of explain the benefits of and the virtues. So we were in the pub. And we were just having a few beers, uh, uh, all the guys from the studio. I was just like, look, why don't we just do a fucking event? Let's just do an event. Let's call it Take Fucking Risks and see what happens. And so, you know, a month later, we did a meetup and 50 people turned up. I couldn't believe 50 people turned up. Um, <laughs> and the name of the event literally, Take Fucking Risks? The, that's that'll, the name of the event. That'll Take turn a few risks. heads. That's very, much, yeah, yeah. that's very much in your wheelhouse. I love it. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and then that's grown now over the last two and a half years. We've put on uh, quite a few events now. They're about once a quarter. Um, and we're now getting 450 people along to these meetups. They're much, much bigger um, to the point where we've now started over the last six months, nine months, we started doing pub crawls in between those big ones. So the big ones are once a quarter. We now put on these pub 
rules where we have five speakers you know at five pubs so a speaker in each pub and everyone has a beer in each pub and they listen you know for like 20 minutes someone talks and you know it explains you know their their take on risk taking and getting noticed and then we move to the next pub and the next pub and it's a really good event for people people come along for networking they come along to kind of learn uh, and be inspired we have a whole range of different types of people we have brands you know prospective clients uh, agencies so our competitors students you know sort of and, and everything really in between but take fucking risks as a whole is has been really successful at promoting our message and it might well be one of the reasons why i'm starting to get you know uh, um, a bit more uh, attention as to what we're saying in the press and things like that because you know we've we kind of put our money where our mouth is and we put these events on yeah have you do you feel that that's been one of the bigger lead gen tools for you in the past couple of years it has um it's one of those things uh i'm i'm I take a pretty prosaic view as to what generates business. I think it's the sum of its parts. I don't think it's just any one thing. So sure. we have we have these events. We have uh, you know our work. We have a podcast of our own. Uh, we are not not wanting to plug a podcast on somebody else's. Um, no, no, <laughs> yeah. What is it called? What is it called? It's, it's called TF, TFR the podcast. We're not allowed to say the word fuck on uh, Spotify or um, iTunes. So, uh, so it's oh, really? TFR for the- for Oh, the, as, the, as the title you can. As the title, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh yeah, that's a bitch, yeah. Um, <laughs> and we're sponsored by, so Spotify sponsored the event, uh, the events yeah. and the podcast, which is great. It's wonderful to have such a cool partner and, and, a, and a partner that really kind of gets the message and, and, and how that fits within the media landscape and the creative landscape. Um, and they're, they're brilliant um the you know but how that fits within a lead gen to go back to your point we, it's a, it's a sum of its parts so we we have um you know research that we produce we have uh, other thing you know other things like that it's a it's a constant banging of the drum around this core message and it's a very singular message um and then you know it's you know someone might come along to an event they might listen to a podcast they might read some of the articles that we've written, you know, thought leadership, et cetera. And then they will then get in touch or they might've seen some work, might've been to an event. You know, it, it, it does vary. There's no any one path. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, business development, you know, really it subscribes to the principles of advertising. It's the same thing. It is frequency and reach. So reach as many people as possible, as often as you can. Um, and then, you know, with those principles, the credibility of a good creative message that is memorable is what will get somebody to remember you, you know, to, to, to recall you when they need to. Um, those are generally the, the principles that we, that we kind of abide by when it comes to lead generation. Um, Got it. I mean, like, I'm sure there are people out there that can give you six easy steps to, you know, and then give you some <laughs> bullshit list, but like, it's not really my, not really my style. No, no, fair enough. No, I was just curious because, you know, when we started the podcast back in February, we're, I think this will be our 34th or 35th episode that we've recorded. I've been yeah. finding just advertising that out on, on, on social and you actually doing paid ads on YouTube for it. Uh, Cause they're a little bit, they're kind of have a tactical message so I can use keywords to kind of target them. Um, I've been getting a lot of phone calls just, Oh, I heard this idea or I heard about this thing that you were yeah. talking about and it's been great. So. I think anything people I think people's behaviors have changed and also anyone that thinks that they can predict human behavior is on a different fucking planet you know we are <laughs> we are not the, we are not robots people are you know they are uh, so enigmatic even yeah. even the most straight laced conservative people you know do not follow a formula so you cannot possibly predict with any kind of certainty the types of behavior here you know you really have to have something that you think is compelling um, and memorable and, you know, uh, warrants piques someone's attention and then smash them in the face as many times as possible with it, with something that, you know, and there are some media that's more effective than others, uh, but, you know, really it, it, it has to use the principles of advertising. For sure. Yeah. I always laugh. I don't know if you've seen those ads on Facebook as well, where they're like, why are you still talking to clients on the phone? 
get like automate your entire sales process using <laughs> like what the fuck how do you get a client without talking to someone that's such a load of shit <laughs> well i've never i've never met a client that doesn't want to speak to you so <laughs> yeah it's like yeah. no why are you still doing why are you still on the phone that's so 2005 like wait what <laughs> so yeah. there's some funny there's some funny SaaS products out there that's for sure yeah 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 definitely have you ever thought about uh hosting some of the the content and some of the talks that you're doing in a in a digital ecosystem rather than some of the in-person stuff um it's a, it's a good question that's a really good question so we played around with live streaming and things um at the start uh, and actually what we found is that people largely the people that uh, that come to the events come along to the events for the contents but they also come along to network to meet people to actually a lot of them just to have have a beer and have a chat you know there's, yeah. there's no uh, so when we were live streaming we, we actually we didn't see a great deal of um interaction and pickup on those things and they're you know they are a bit of, they're, they're a bit of work to put on and 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 they end up distracting you from something that actually does really get people's attention so yeah. in the events um we actually keep it um really tight around the event and the podcast that wraps around that. So yep. the thing that uh, Spotify uh, and our um, partnership with those guys um, that's been over the last sort of six months or so is the, is the relationship between the live events, so the podcast, sorry, uh, the pub crawls and the, um, and the live events and the big ones, and then the podcast. So it's bringing together the live uh, content with the, with the podcast things that are obviously recorded and they can return to and you know whatever platform they're on you know yeah. itunes spotify soundcloud whatever it may well be um and that's quite novel people really like that we refer to different things you know the live events refer to the podcast the podcast will reference something that happened in an event when we're talking to somebody and so that becomes quite a rich uh, area for people to to learn and, and to uh, get different experiences and different uh, um inspirations and, and just learn about different things they may not know about sure yeah one the one reason i asked is uh i i discovered a software uh about a month ago it turns out that a guy from the uk actually made it it's a guy i met in in austin texas a couple of years ago and i had always liked the idea of well what if i compile some great content some great talks but i don't like webinars I'm not a webinar guy they just there's something about them that just pushes me the wrong way um anyway so he made a made a product called hey summit okay um fairly new uh, not a lot of people know about it yet but i would take a look at it so the idea is whether it's a pre-recorded video or it's a live stream video it's like hosting a conference online so you've got okay. speakers scheduled at whatever time and then they can either be live or pre-recorded they can do q a but the thing i like about the software is it it automates everything for you so it creates a website where people can go on and book and choose which talks they want. Um, when you have speakers signing up, they have like a portal where they can put their, their bio and their info and their outbound links. Um, and so I'm actually doing one right now. It's like, it's gonna be for uh, creating content on LinkedIn to kind of build your personal brand. So I have six speakers, they're all gonna do like a 10 to 15 minute thing on some tactical thing that they know about how to do. But I like it because the software will ping them like a week before and say, hey, you haven't uploaded this yet, or hey, we're still missing that. And it automates notifications to the people that are signed up to it. Hey, it's coming up tomorrow. Hey, the talk that you want is on now. And then it, it houses all the content in one space. So you could use it as like an evergreen, piece of content yeah. on the internet. Sorry, I'm going to write that down. What's it called? <laughs> it's called Hey Summit. H-E-Y yeah. Summit. And I, I was, you know, I looked at some options around how to do, because I like, I, we do some workshops as well. And, um, but, but the idea of putting them online was always a big challenge. Like, what am I going to do? Make a mini site? Where am I going to host the videos? It's going to be all Google Drive links. It's going to be ugly as shit. And then this thing is an absolute godsend. It's, yeah. it's fair. I think he made it about two years ago. I was actually in a forum asking about, Hey, does anybody know if this is any good? I saw a deal on AppSumo and da, 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 da. And then he reached out to me. He's like, Mike, this is my software. I'm like, Oh, damn, <laughs> I got to get on it. So yeah, I haven't okay, officially, yeah, look. I haven't officially used it, but I've got, you know, six speakers over one day and I'm just going to start promoting it. Um, this week, but I I think it would be a really good space 
for you guys, especially if you're making awesome content and you're not quite sure how to keep it in one place for people to have a portal to learn or to be able to participate if they're further away. Cause that's always gives you a bit of an advantage if someone can, can watch it on their own time, right? Come watch yeah. the recording whenever you want and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. I'm going to take a look at that. That sounds interesting. Yeah. And then I was like, I was just curious cause I, I tried to look it up before, but I wasn't able to see, do you guys do your own Google and Facebook ads? Do you run any ads right now for yourself? Just out no. of curiosity. No, no. no. So um, our, I suppose our advertising is our, predominantly our work because, um, you know, if it's doing its job, then other people are going to see it and then yeah, yeah. find out about us. Um, the press that we generate off our work and what we talk about, you know, our kind of ethos, our DNA. Um, and then, like I said, the, the contents of the live events, the podcasts, the pub crawls, mm-hmm. um, and then the, the thought leaderships, the writing. I mean, I'm, I'm constantly on LinkedIn, I, uh, shatting my mouth, you know, sort of shoot my mouth off and... Um, <laughs> picking fights with people basically for sure (laughs) i was just curious yeah because sometimes like and i don't i don't use it for like net new inbound but i like to you know if if we had some pr or some whatever it'd be nice to run that piece of content as like an awareness thing but um i guess i guess being that you you guys are small by design as long as you've got the door knocking as much as you need it knocking um yeah it's one of those things it's kind of who you know who you want and and you know, is someone going to buy our services based on some social media advertising? My, you know, my guess is probably not that many. And so does it, warrant, uh, does it warrant it? If we were doing something else, then probably it would, you know. Mm-hmm. And I also think that the, uh, the way that the, the London market works, you know, that, uh, the, uh, I mean, we, we work with clients all over the world, but, you know, there's a good concentration of them uh, in London. Um, you know, really it's, it's, it's a word of mouth. It's uh, they come along to the event. It's that kind of thing that ge- generates, um, you know, leads uh, as opposed to social media stuff. If we were selling a product um, or something that was more it, or a service that had been commoditized, then maybe it's something that would, uh, would work for us, but probably yeah. uh, more on, um, uh, uh, for us, it's it's more about the sort of the richer uh, live environments, that are the the the, uh, the the richest source of uh, leads, and 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 kind of just getting our name out there for us. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I mean, you guys are a perfect example. In a way, I have conversations with people all the time. Oh, well, we're only a couple people, and we couldn't do this. We wouldn't have time for that. And I'm like, no, no, you're just you're just not making time. You're just fucking you're lazy. Just not, no, no. You're just fucking lazy. Like, you know, like, I mean, the, the, uh, the lady that runs, uh, take fucking risks, mm. you know, so cookie Tabiner, she's fucking amazing. She, uh, she was an intern. She was interning with us for three months when we decided, when we were in the pub to decide to do these events. And obviously she was an intern. She was keen to get a job. <laughs> um, and she's just like, fuck it, it, hand the man up. I'll do it. No experience, literally yeah. no experience. She was a graduate. <laughs> she just finished university. Um, and she is now, you know, the queen of TFR. She's the queen of take fucking miss right. um, across London. And she runs those um, single handedly, pretty much. She pretty much puts them on single handedly. She does everything about them. And she does that, you know, in conjunction with her day to day job, you know, as a right. creator. Um, so, I don't agree that they're, the, they're this huge thing that can't possibly be done unless you've got a team of a hundred people. Right. Just fucking pull your finger out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Very cool. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that was all, I was, I was kind of all the questions I had. I, I was like really drawn. I was just drawn to the whole experience of you on another podcast. And I was like, man, we've got to chat. And I think, I think what you're doing, uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, we're, we're a younger company, but it's funny when I heard some of the way you described it, I was like, Oh man, it's like, so it's in such alignment. And I think a lot of even big brands are going to start to feel the pinch of like, are our programmatic banner ads doing anything and start to figure out not a fucking chance. Um, (laughs) And you know what I mean? They're going to start moving towards. Yeah guys like you and, and agencies like yourself. So it's really fun, really exciting. Actually, the one other thing I wanted, I was thinking about was I, I've talked to a lot of different agency owners, specifically marketing people. Um, 
And what they generally will do on top of having the service-based business is they always, not always, but will typically have some kind of tool or software that they're either working on or they've built to kind of scratch an internal itch of themselves that they're like, oh, maybe we should actually commercialize this thing. Have you guys ever thought about that? Yeah, we have. And we've, we've, had, a, we've had a bit of success with a couple of those. Um, and so, I mean, an example, example of the one that's actually out there and has been quite successful. I mean, like we don't earn any money from it. it we, we, sell, you know, we put it out there for free. Um, so we use Slack internally as our um, communication tool. Uh, and because we're English, we drink a lot of tea um, because that's the stereotype. And we, uh, we would always argue over whose round it was. We'd be like, no, it's, I made the last round. It's your fucking turn. Well, you know, whatever. <laughs> I and love so that that's an actual, I love that that's an actual <laughs> argument that happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, right, well, um, let's make, so just born out of our arguments, mm. um, we, we devised, we built a, a little app that we then put in the Slack app store um, called Risky Picker. Um, and so if you go into app store, you can find it risky picker. And what that does is it allows you to randomize and you can say, you know, who's going to make the next round and then it will choose whoever, you know, out of the people Someone that are in your Slack channel <laughs> and then you can make the round. And it has been downloaded by hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, big numbers and some <laughs> huge, <laughs> fucking huge brands, uh, yeah. have downloaded it. And it is just, it's just a joke, but what it got us to do, obviously we got to write, some funny quippy lines that go with uh with the you know with the when you're chosen um and it got us to you know like you say like itch that scratch um because i mean it is worth saying that we have a lot of empathy for clients i mean i i you know i talk like i'm quite um forthright in how we talk but we are we have a lot of empathy for clients and the and the problems that clients have internally and it can sound a lot sexier in you know agency land than than it is in you know when you're in-house uh, you know uh, working for a, a big corporate or you're working for a, a mid-sized firm or a startup or whatever it may well be and you uh, it's not just agencies that can that have to have these kind of side hustles these sort of uh, sideline projects you know i think everyone should be thinking like that and for us, we're able to demonstrate our empathy for clients with little projects like that. We go, hey, look, you know, we're able to do this. And it spawned a couple of um, conversations, you know, with clients where they go, that's really cool. It's really funny. But, you know, uh, so it, it can demonstrate how you think and, mm -hmm. and how you have empathy for a client and how you could potentially have um, empathy and understanding for the problems and challenges that they're facing. Sure. And I bet you, I guess in some instances, it would almost become part of that potential strategy with that person. Yeah, it can be. I mean, I think people can, and I've seen a lot of side hustles. I mean, the, the, you know, the UK, we call them side hustles. I don't know if that's the same in the States. Yes, but, same deal here. Yeah. Um, but I've seen a lot of them fail because people overcomplicate them at the start. They think about how am I going to sell this, you know, for <laughs> hundreds of millions of dollars in two years time you're like no yeah. don't fucking think like that just think about getting a small product out there that probably is clunky and it's a bit cumbersome it doesn't really work that well but it's you get it out there and then you refine it and you work on it this is a side hustle this is not like a client yeah. project this is something <laughs> on the side you know you're not getting paid for this don't have these grand plans about how you're going to make hundreds of millions of dollars when you sell this little thing that you did on the sidelines if you do then great but get it out there first the, the most difficult thing is getting something out there and then you can refine it and you can play with it and if you know you may well realize shit there's loads of people that really want this right i'm going to put some more time into it and i'm going to refine it or people go what the hell that's just ridiculous that's right. not that's that's not even a thing that's just <laughs> yeah you just wasted your time and you go cool didn't Got know it. that <laughs> <laughs> um won't put any more time into that think of the next one so yeah. yeah, I think a lot of these people they 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 overcomplicate them at the start. You just got to start really simple. Think of a problem that you that you experience yourself, and just get something out there and and see what happens. Got it. And actually, one final thing. Sorry, what what advice do you have? So you know, there's going to be small businesses and some entrepreneurs listening, and 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 obviously not all of them are going to be a good fit as a client for for you know for yourself. So if you were to give some advice, how would you tell people to think? about what it is that you guys do in terms of 
taking risks? How do they go? How do they go into it with the right mindset when they're thinking about how do I market my my little company here that I'm going to try and do myself? Um, the, so th there's a couple of ways you can do it. The first one is to think uh, no one really cares. Like no one cares about you or your product or your service. You know, really, no one gives a shit about you. Yeah. So you have to try so hard to get their attention. Now you've got some people that are clients that are customers already there. So they do care a little bit, um, but not that much. Um, you know, you're, you know, you're not Apple. <laughs> so you, you're not, they're not carrying around your, your iPhone in, in their pocket. And they're like, fuck, well, I'm screwed if I don't have my iPhone, you know, right. let's, let's be honest here. Um, so think like that. And you think, well, how could I get someone's attention if they don't care? about me and if you're able to have the humility to put yourself out there and the, and the uh the i suppose like just the fragility of that you go look i'm gonna put myself out there and it is daunting to go against the grain you know uh, and to go in a different direction to everybody else in in an industry that is daunting and it takes real guts but it if it if it makes you feel nervous then it's the right thing to do you're on the right path. The minute you go, hey, we're going to put some advertising out there or some marketing out there, and you're like, yeah, of course, no problem, mm. uh, then you might as well not bother because it's the reason you will feel like that is because everyone else is doing something of that same type, and therefore you're just wasting your time. You're in that 89%. Mm -hmm. To get into that 11% where you're remembered, you know, your gut you're going to have the butterfly feeling in your stomach. You're going to feel nervous, but your gut, you know, your gut instinct is an incredibly good barometer of, of things. And people don't trust their gut enough. Really. They're yeah. far more interested in data and seeing if uh, data supports decisions that they're making. And I'm not saying that all data sucks, but mm. I've never understood why people don't trust the, the one human you know, the instincts that we have as a human was incredibly sophisticated machines. Um, <laughs> so why would we not listen to that stuff? And if you, if, if you feel nervous when you're about to put something out, then that probably means it's the right thing to do. So, to, so my advice is to trust your gut. Um, as it comes to working with us, like we'll work, we'll work with anybody. We'll sell, yeah. you know, we'll sell anything. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not fussed. Um, so, uh, so I, I think that's the, that's the piece of advice that I would have in, in that respect. Love it. That's perfect. And actually really funny that you said, nobody cares about what you're doing. This is, <laughs> I have to show you this just cause it's funny. This is, this has been on my, this has been my screensaver for years. What does it say? Uh, no. <laughs> Nobody cares about what you're doing. Don't forget that. It's such a motivator for me because it's, it's funny that you said it because it's so true. <laughs> yeah. So perfect. Well, look, true. look, I really appreciate your time. And uh, it, was a, it was a great chat. Where can people find uh, all of your, where can they find you on the internet? Okay. So we are on, uh, so Meller and Smith is that you can find me there. So that's Meller and Smith dot com. Um, the best place to find me personally is on LinkedIn. So I'm just to search for Paul Meller. Um, you'll see me. I'm in a bright, I'm in a set of bright pink overalls as my uh, profile picture. Um, I don't really go in for any of the other social media. Um, and then in terms of take fucking risks, uh, if they want to get tickets or find out more or any of that kind of stuff or the podcasts, then you can just, you go to uh, TFR dot events. So TFR is in take fucking risks dot events. And that's the web address. And they can go there. They can see what speakers we've had and the, and the various th and the events we've got coming up. And then you can link to the podcast, the people we've had on there. And, and yeah, like come and, uh, come and troll me on LinkedIn. I don't mind. You know, like yeah. it's cool. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, thanks so much. No worries. Nice to meet you. You too, man. Thanks. Bye.